right, letter G. Oh, others would be lonely when all their friends are gone. My Lord is ever standing by my side. There is a heavy load upon me, and yet I'm pressing on, because I found a Savior, friend, and guide. Oh, yes, I have somebody with me to share the heavy load. I feel His presence near me every day. Somebody with me all the way. In bitter toll and sorrow and heartaches, not a few, but consolation sweet is mine each day. And soon I'm going home tomorrow when life on earth is through. I have somebody with me all the way. Oh, yes, I have somebody with me to share the heavy load. I feel His presence near me every day. And although trouble overtakes me along life's weary road, I have somebody with me all the way. Some folks have lots of pity, they say I'm sad and low, but I don't need their sympathy at all. At all, for in that golden city, my Lord's prepared a home. I'm leaving when I hear the final call. Oh, yes, I have somebody with me to share the heavy load. I feel His presence near me every day. And although trouble overtakes me along life's weary road, I have somebody with me all the way. Oh, yes, I have somebody with me to share the heavy load. I feel His presence near me every day, and all the trouble overtakes me along life's weary road. I have somebody with me all the way. Coming soon, Jesus in all his glory, yeah. not just a Savior, but a reigning King. Coming soon, and the whole world will be witness. Oh, be ready, for he is coming soon. Once he came to this world of sin and sorrow, a humble baby in a manger in Bethlehem. But this time he's coming in all his power. Great kings of earth will bow and worship his great name. And when he comes, he'll bind the power of, oh, Satan. Little children with the lambs and lions will play. All the earth will be filled with his glory. No need for crying, for all tears are wiped away. Coming soon, Jesus in all his glory, not just a savior, but a reigning king. Coming soon, and the whole world will be witness. Oh, be ready, for he is coming soon. Oh, be ready, for he is coming soon. Amen. Coming soon, Jesus in all his glory. Thank you, Miss Tressa. 
Let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. As we look at this uh, account of what Jesus did in the temple, I saw it myself in a little bit of a different light this last time that I studied it. And I hope that you'll see it in the light as well as we're going to preach it today. There are a lot of lessons from Jesus going into the temple and uh, driving out all the animals and uh, you know, telling them that uh, my house is to be a house of prayer, not a house of merchandise. And then later, we see probably three years later, that Jesus was uh, back in the temple again. And uh, this time, instead of saying, uh, my house was meant to be a house, my father's house is a house of prayer, but you've made it a house of merchandise, he says, uh, my house is a, my father's house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And so as we look at John chapter 2, this is just after Jesus was baptized. He had just performed his first miracle at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. And now he's gone south into uh, uh, Judea, to Jerusalem. He's at the temple. And the first of two times, Jesus goes into the temple and cleans house. And so let's read this scripture here. Chapter number 2, beginning of verse number 13. I'll ask you to stand if you're able. Chapter 2 of John, beginning in verse number 13. It says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen, sheep, and doves, and changes of money sitting. When he made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty-six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us today to see something special in this passage. As Jesus relates here with humans, and as he goes into the temple and sets them straight, help us also to see here the key to this passage is the truth of Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead. And help us to understand today by your spirit that Christianity rests upon the foundation of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And that this is the greatest sign that he is who he claimed to be. Help this preacher today, fill him with your spirit. Give him insights. Take him in the direction you would have him to go. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. What proof does Jesus have that he had the right to go into the temple in Jerusalem and run off those who were profiting at the expense of God's people? You know, more generally, what proof does Jesus offer to show us that he is 
and he deserves to be in our lives, Lord. And as we look at this passage, we're kind of going to look beyond what Jesus did in the temple, although we will discuss that. And we're going to see that Jesus' authenticity and authority rest in the fact that he has risen from the dead. We see here Jesus' passion on display in verses 13 through 17. A lot of times we think about Jesus and, you know, I'm one of those people that believes that images of Christ are a violation of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, the commandment, a second commandment, not to make any images and not to worship any images. And I think that maybe bland pictures like in Sunday school lessons where it's very clear that it's not really Jesus, you know, maybe for instruction purposes, but I'm thankful when I, when I came here to Calvary, I didn't have to deal with any portraits of Jesus, you know, here in the sanctuary. Because a picture paints a thousand words. And a lot of times as you go to the flea market and you see these pictures of Jesus for sale, you see a weak character. Someone who looks even sickly and, and pale and has that long flowing hair. And nobody knows exactly what Jesus looked like. Although being Jewish, he probably had a tan. You know, his hair was probably black instead of, you know, brown or... Or, or, or blonde. I mean, it's just these pictures don't do Jesus justice. But one of the things we see here is one of the strongest, if not the strongest, acts of aggression that Jesus made in his lifetime. Jesus could be righteously angry. And he was righteously angry here. And, and, and three years later, when he came back here, he was righteously angry again when he came and he cleaned out his father's house. Now, verse number 13, we get a glimpse of who the audience is that John is writing to by inspiration of God's Spirit. He says, the Jews pass over. Now, you know, if he was writing to a Jewish audience, he would not need to put this. But John is writing to the entire world. This is, an, this is a, a gospel for the world at large. And so he specifies for those who are not familiar with the Jews' religion that the Passover is a Jewish, uh, a Jewish holy day. And so here's Passover. It's near. And it says, Jew, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 says, The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. We see here Jesus fulfilling this prophecy in verse number 14. And it says here that Jesus found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. Now when it says in the temple, it's talking about the courtyards around the temple which was still seen as the temple grounds. So here you are going to, to, to bring your sacrifice to God, going to worship God, and you have all this commotion in the courtyard. You know, people may be bickering over whether or not to pay this much or that much for a particular sheep, you know, or maybe a little bird that they want to sacrifice for some of the poorer people. And all of this stuff was going on in the courtyard of the temple. And so what people would do is they would take their dirty Roman money, which they would consider it dirty because it's Gentile. And of course, Gentiles in the eyes of the Jews of that day were, were dogs. <laughs> That's how they viewed them, and that wasn't a pleasant thing in that day. And they would take the Roman money, and they would exchange it for temple money. Then they would take the temple money and they would buy their animals with it for the sacrifice. And you can see in this whole process, someone might say, well, that's really convenient. You know, here you have someone right at the temple 
who will sell you the animal that you need in order to make your sacrifice. We know it's real convenient, you know, when you go to an amusement park and they have food there available. But what happens to the prices at those amusement parks? They're higher. The prices are higher. And that's exactly what was happening at the temple here. And so they were making a profit off of God's people. The priest, the one in charge of the temple, maybe they were renting space like you do at a flea market. Maybe they got a commission like you do at a consignment shop. I don't know, but the priest there at the temple were making money. The money changers, they're probably like a lot of people. You know, I don't like to eat at a restaurant where I can't see the prices on the menu board, okay? You know, if you don't see the price of the drink, it's probably over $2, and you stay away from ordering a drink. Okay, that's my philosophy, okay? But so they probably, these money changers, probably didn't have a sign saying it's worth this much today. And they'd probably size you up and see what kind of a person you are, whether you're gullible or not, whether you're familiar with what currency is trading for, and they'd say, okay, you know, here you go. You know, we'll give you this much for this amount of Roman money. And so here the priests are making money off the people. The money changers are making money off the people. And then you have the people selling the animals are making money off the people. And it made our Lord sick. And you can preach a whole message on the principles in this. You know, when I was down in Tennessee... There was a certain preacher that came in, and uh, he brought all kind of stuff. I don't know where he got this stuff from. T-shirts and hats and all this sort of stuff. And we, the, the church in Tennessee had a small foyer like the one we have at our church. And you couldn't hardly get through that foyer without being overwhelmed with all this merchandise. <laughs> There's one guy in the church and, uh, named Ed Hall, and uh, he, would, he came through. That, that hallway filled with stuff. And he did this. He said, tweet, 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 tweet. <laughs> now what was he doing? He was referring to this passage here. You know, where they were selling all this merchandise and trying to make money off of God's people. And so I'm very leery. If you want to sell a music CD or you want to sell a ministry, something that'll help you in ministry, a book or a DVD or something, that's fine. But just bringing your wares and selling them in the church, you know, having, you know, rummage sales or bazaars at the church. You know, if you want to, you know, go on a mission trip and you want to do it in town somewhere or something, that's fine. If you want to raise money for camp, that's fine. But the church is not to be a place that's known as a place to make money, but it's to be known as a place where we come and we meet with our God. And that's what Jesus' reaction was to all that was going on in the courtyard of the temple. Verse number 15. Jesus said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Get them out of here. Get them out of here. So what did Jesus do? Well, he made him a small whip. And then he took the animals that were in the temple courtyard and started beating them, getting them out of there. Not to hurt them, but to get them out of there. You know, what did he do? He overturned the tables with the money spilling on the ground. What did he do? You know, he, he set the doves free so they could fly away. He was mad. Now let me tell you something. Let me ask you a question. You know, why is it that nobody stopped Jesus from doing what he did? You ever think about that? There were probably more priests and more salesmen there in that courtyard. Yeah, of course there were. Then there were Jesus and his five disciples and maybe his mother who was with him. Well, the reason is because no one can hinder Jesus unless Jesus allows them to. J.C. Ryle says this, They had no power against Jesus except 
when he permitted it. You know, over in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember, who do you come for? Jesus asked the crowd with their torches and their swords. And they say, we come for Jesus. And he says, I am. <laughs> and what happens to all those people with the torches and the swords? It's an amazing thing. They all fall back, it says in the scripture. You know, they only took Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane because his hour had come and because he allowed them to. And so if Jesus wants to clean out his father's house, Guess who can stop him? Nobody, unless Jesus allows them to stop him. Because he is God. Verse number 16. Take these things hence. Get these things out of here. Take your animals. Take your coins. Get them out of here. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. My Father's temple is not to be a place where prophets are made. And that makes, it so, makes me so angry. You see people on television. I grew up in the Oral Roberts generation. Sow your seed, receive your need. <laughs> that was his big phrase. I remember that song as a child. Sow, sow your seed. Expectation is the key. Don't let a miracle pass you by. You know, send us money and you'll receive you know, fruit for your seed. And So many people are taken in by that. And that sort of thing makes God angry. And so this is not to be a place where prophets, earthly prophets are made. But the main thing in this phrase here is when he calls the temple my father's house. Because when he says that God is his father, he is claiming to have the authority of God upon him, and he is claiming to be God himself. And this is a serious thing. Look at John chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Here we have Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath, telling that man who was uh, there by the pool of Bethesda to take his mat and carry it home. Go on home. The man did it. And uh, it says in verse number uh, 16, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. You see, Jesus, by saying, my father, they know that Jesus is referring to God. And yes, the seventh day, the Bible says God rested. But that is just setting an example for us. God who never tires, if he were to rest for a day, this world and this universe would fall apart. And so, so God the Father never rests in the way that we rest. You know, if I go home this afternoon and do what I call horizontal meditation and I start just sleeping, the whole world's not going to fall apart. But if God ever did that, the one who holds everything together, we would be in a lot of trouble. And so they understood he was talking about God as his father. And so it says in verse 18 of John 5, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, and here's the key, making himself equal with God. Throughout the book of John, he's talking about Jesus as God. And whenever you see Son of God, you think equal with God. Whenever you see Jesus referring to God as my Father, you think equal with God the Father. That's how the Jews were thinking. And so he says, my Father's house. 
My father's house. This is my dad's house. And that was some serious stuff. Verse 17 says, And his disciples remembered, back in John 2, that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. That's in Psalm 69, verse number 9. A prophecy of the Messiah given by David. And so we see here in verses 13 through 17, Jesus' passion. He had a passion that his father's house not be defiled in any way. And we, like Jesus, ought to have that same passion. And that is that his house, the church, ought not be defiled in any way. You know, whosoever will may come. We sang that song today. And whosoever will may come and be here in the Lord's house and hear the word of God preached. I don't care who you are. But when it comes to those who are members of the church and when it comes to the activities that are sponsored by the church, we ought to always be careful to remember whose building this is. And we ought to always be careful to remember whose church this is. It is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to reflect him well. Okay, so that's kind of an introduction here. Verse number 18 says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? In verses 18 through 22, we see Jesus' authority. His authority. They're saying to Jesus, What are your credentials, Jesus? Show them to us. And perhaps they, you know, were thinking maybe he would work some sort of a miracle. And they could see this miracle and, and be awed by it. So in verse number 19 of John chapter 2, Jesus answered and said unto them, Here's the sign that I have the right to drive you all out of my father's house. Here is the sign that I am who I claim to be. Destroy this temple, and in three days will I raise it up. And I think Jesus, when he said this temple, I believe he took his finger and he pointed at himself. You see, the greatest sign, the greatest proof that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and Savior of the world is his resurrection from the dead. You kill this body. You destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. <clears throat> we see something very similar in a different situation. Matthew 12. Verse 38. It says, And certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, <coughs> Master or teacher, we would see a sign from thee. Once again, give us some proof, Jesus. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What do we see here? Look to Jonah, Jesus says. Look to Jonah, and you'll have your sign. Just like Jonah was three days and three nights, in the, bail, in, in, in the belly of the whale, so too will I be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. And then just like that whale spit up Jonah the prophet on the shore, the grave won't be able to hold me, and I will rise from the dead. And that is the greatest sign the greatest proof that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah and the Savior of the world. And that is what? 
his resurrection from the dead. Now there's something else we see here in this passage in John chapter 2. He says, I will raise it up. Now certainly, you know, we see God the Father and God the Holy Spirit involved in Jesus' resurrection. In fact, it says in the scripture, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives within us and will raise us up from the dead one day. But Jesus makes it very clear. He says, I will raise it up. What makes Jesus' resurrection unique is that he rose from the dead in his own strength. You see, there are other people that rose from the dead. You know, that, that, that son of the widow, Jesus touched and he rose from the dead. Lazarus, the little girl. You know, back in the Old Testament, you know, uh, you know Elijah, you know, laying on the body of the uh, of the uh, of the child was that Elijah or Elisha? Elijah. Elisha. I'm sorry, Elisha, laying on the body of the child, and the life coming back in the child, and the child coming back to life that was given to this widow at Zarephath. You know, we think about you know resurrection is something we've seen before, but no one has been resurrected by his own power before. And Jesus says, you destroy this temple. You kill me on a cross. And three days later, I will be back by my own strength and my own power. Now, verse number 21. But he spake of the temple of his body. He spake of the temple of his body. Well, this is what the Jews missed. Because verse number 20, Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Now what are they talking about here? Forty-six years. Well, according to the Jewish historian Josephus, the present temple that was there in Jerusalem had been being repaired for forty-six years. And so if that is the case, then what Jesus is hearing from these Jewish leaders is, it has taken us 46 years to put the temple in as good a shape as you see it today. We've been working to repair and rebuild this temple for 46 years. And you're saying, Jesus, that you can do this work in three